and welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. I'm glad that you can all be here with us today. I am, of course, Pastor Jerry Hemmingson, and I do not look much like Pastor Fitzgee. He's younger, taller, better looking, and maybe smarter than me. But other than that, he's got nothing over on me, so we'll do fine today. And our purpose here for today, of course, is to bring praise and glory to our Savior Jesus Christ. We will do that this morning through our liturgies, through our confessions, through our Bible readings, through our prayers, through our songs, and of course through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And our service today begins with crown him with many crowns. Please stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. 
and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, and bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is present in the song of praise to the The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars. He gives to all of them. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond us. Glory be. <clears throat> Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us. Lord have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. And on
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you exalted your Son to the place of all honor and authority. Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit, that confessing Jesus as Lord, we may be led into all truth through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed. He, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his way, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the depth of death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. We speak responsibly the gradual. He will command his angels concerning you, to guard, to guard you, you in, in all, all your ways. ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, and all that, that is within me. me. Bless, Bless his, his holy name. name. The epistle is from Philippians chapter 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry, from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at, ev so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in, run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, likewise, 
you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe in me? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they will hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go, work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go to the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your mind and believe him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess and profess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his word before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, guys, for our children's sermon this morning. We're going to keep talking about this book. It's a little book with a big name. It starts with a C. It's called the Catechism. Remember that? And we're working our way through the Ten Commandments. So, we're on commandment number six, which is, you shall not commit adultery. So what does this mean? Well, this commandment tells us that whenever moms and dads or two people that love each other get married, God doesn't want them to split up and split apart. God wants them in their marriage to help each other, to love each other, and to support each other. 
through all the rest of their life. So that's how we can follow the sixth commandment. Commandment six. You shall not commit adultery. And we continue with our sermon hymn. Grace and peace unto you from God our Father, and from his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our message today comes from our Gospel reading, and we're going to talk about credentials, because that's essentially what it is about. You know, in this day and age, many jobs that we have require credentials. Some may be certificates of achievement, others may be college diplomas or degrees, some may be even a laying on of hands and an ordination or a dedication to service to God. Some may be from years and years of experience, but we all have something that qualifies us for what we are doing. Now I have from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, a certificate on my wall that says, the Reverend Gerald Hemmingson. I'm never called the Reverend or Gerald, but that's the way they put it anyway. The Reverend Gerald Hemmingson is certified to be ordained and eligible for call to the churches of the Missouri Synod. That's my credentials. So if somebody wanted to know how I can do this, that would be my statement. There it is. Today, the Pharisees are going to try to nail Jesus about credentials. What credentials does he have to be running around creating miracles, teaching teachings that are way different than what they've been trying to teach the people? Now these are people who have changed things over the hundreds of years of life. 
way back in the days of Moses, there was the tribe of Levi was to be the church workers. Some to be priests, some to be workers, depending on which member of the tribe of Levi they were children of. But they all had their purpose in the church. Well, someplace over the years, things had changed. Some priests were still from the tribe of Levi. Others had purchased their way into the priesthood. They could do that because they were now under the government of Rome, and Rome allowed such things. So the priests weren't necessarily the most educated in theology. They weren't necessarily the ones that God had ordained for the job. But they were the ones that wanted to control the law. The Pharisees had added law after law after law to define the law. And the interesting thing about it is as they made these laws, they exempted themselves because they were good enough they didn't need to pay attention to them. They were the holy ones. And now comes Jesus. And he's teaching to anybody who will listen. Be it a Pharisee, which very few listened, a few did. Or be it somebody from the dredges of society. And they didn't like the lessons he was teaching. Because he was teaching, by the grace of God, you're forgiven. You don't have to do 102 things and ceremonies to be forgiven. All you got to do is go to your father and ask him. So they come up to Jesus and they said, it's enough of this. We want to know where you think you get the authority to do these things. Creating miracles, raising people from the dead, healing the sick, and by changing our theology. What gives you the right? And Jesus looks at him and he says, yeah, let me tell you. But first answer a question for me. Now this is a pretty good debate tactic even in today's age. Answer a question with a question. And he says, now John the Baptist, you know him. Did his authority come from heaven or did his authority come from man? Now all of a sudden, this catch-22 question that they thought they had asked Jesus had been turned 100% around on them. Where did the Baptist get his authority? And they say to themselves, oh my, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? Because if we say it come from heaven, he's going to say, well, why didn't you listen to it? And if we say it come from man, the people aren't going to like that because they hold him up to be a prophet of God. So they say, we don't know. So Jesus pretty much tells them, well then I don't owe you an answer. I'm not going to tell you where my authority come from. But let me pose this to you. If a man comes to his son and he says to him, go work in the vineyard today. And the son says, nah, I don't think so, not today. But after the father leaves, he changes his mind and he realizes that's what he should do. So he goes out and he works the day in the vineyard. He goes to his other son and he says, go, work in the vineyard. And the son says, I'll do it. And as soon as father's left, he's back to his video games and he doesn't do anything. And Jesus says, which one of them did the father's will? Which one did the Father's will? Well, the one that went out and did the work, of course. And he says, that's right. But he says, now let me tell you something about the work of the kingdom. I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in righteousness. Now notice, he's actually ask, answering the question they first asked right here. John came to you in righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they believed him. And it is still that way today. 
Some of those that think they are the powerful and mighty of our civilization does not believe that God controls it. And God is still welcoming the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the publicans. There's a story, true story, about a gal named Iris Blue. Grew up in Houston, Texas. She lived a rebellious life and she was in trouble from the time she was an early teen on. She got into prostitution. When she was 17 she was arrested and she was convicted and she spent seven years in prison. And when she got out of prison she went back to the streets. She became part of the Banditos motorcycle gang. She became addicted to heroin. She had more abortions than she could keep track of. And as she grew older she graduated from being a prostitute to being the pimp. Now one of her clients for some reason changed his ways, found Christ, started going to church, started believing and he started thinking that he really should tell all these people he used to hang out with about Jesus. So he did and he told Iris all about Jesus and she cussed at him, sent him away. So he called her and says, you know God loves you and he cares for you and she hung up on him. And when he had seen almost the end of his line, he called her one more time and says, I'm coming down to the bar to talk to you. Meet me outside. And she did. And when she came out, he says, I'm done preaching at you. She at first thought that was kind of a relief. He says, but I can't even see you anymore now because I promised God that I would quit hanging out with tramps. And she said in her mind, things were going through so fast. She says, I wanted to strike back at him. I'd like to have grabbed him by the throat. All this time he'd been telling me how precious I am to God. And now I'm no more than trash. But before she could say any of that, he continued. And it's all because you don't even understand. Jesus can turn you into a lady. And those words struck her. And she thought to herself, A lady, that's all I ever wanted to be. Respectable lady. Her night turned and she became a lady. She started following Jesus. She learned more about him. Then she started talking about him. And she traveled worldwide to anybody that would listen and tell them about Jesus. Now, if only the Pharisees could have done what Iris did. If only they would have listened to the Baptist. If they would have only recognized that the Baptist was from the prophet Malachi, he was the one to come to lead the way to the Messiah. They too could have turned their lives around. But they remained so clouded in their own hypocrisy and their own self-importance. And Jesus was able to point that out to them by their own admission that they could not tell whether John was authorized by heaven or by man. Because the true priests of the people would know. And their worst fear was coming true. Jesus, by telling them that the prostitutes and the tax collectors could get into the kingdom of God easier than they could, had made them look the fool. They must have been furious. Just in a couple of sentences, this man, they thought they were going to drive out of the temple and get rid of all of his teachings all in one time, had made them look silly. Now people back in that day, they treasured their priests. And they looked upon them to know the discernment of God. And when they realized that 
these people couldn't even discern whether John was a prophet or not, they lost credibility in the eyes of the people. And Jesus is simply saying, once you realize where John's authority comes from, you'll know where mine comes from. Because it's spelled out in the scripture they had. All the prophecies that led to knowing that Jesus was the Messiah and is the Savior yet today. The Jews took pride in the fact that they were God's people. And they were not happy that their leaders seemed to be no longer God's people. The Pharisees lost a lot of their respect, respect that they had never earned. People started doubting them as theological rulers. And yet today, this very question is still a pertinent one to ask. We learn what we know about Jesus from the Bible. So what we need to ask is to us, what is the Bible? Does it come from the inspired Word of God or does it come from man? If it comes from the inspired Word of God, then we know everything in it is true. We know that Jesus is the Lord. We know that He is the only way to heaven. And we know we must follow those teachings no matter what our natural instinct tells us. But if it is just a book written by some very brilliant but still normal human men and women, what do we have? You see, it is the divine authority that tells us Jesus is the Son of God. It is with divine authority that we learn that He is our Savior. It is with divine authority that we are taught the behaviors that please God. So if we are truly committed Christians, we must accept the Bible as the divine inspired words of God written by many authors under His inspiration and guidance. Because God resides in those teachings from the Bible. And it does not matter whether it goes against the grains of society. Because right now society is trying to teach us that the Bible is so much irrelevant that it no longer applies as the laws of life. They can change them to fit what they find gives them earthly pleasure. We do not do that. We stand by the words that we have learned since we were babes. And we stand by them because we know that they come from God. We believe that Jesus, when he delegated his apostles and disciples to go to the world and to tell the story of Jesus and the death and resurrection and the bringing people back to God. We believe those words to be truth. And we believe that we are to spend our life improving ourselves as we go. Knowing that we will not reach perfection this side of heaven does not stop us from continuing to move forward. And knowing that we do not reach perfection this side of heaven is why we stand every Sunday morning and we confess that we are sinners and the pastor delivers the absolution reminding us that God has forgiven us. That is why we're going to come up just in a little bit and take the Holy Communion, the sacraments from Christ, receive His body and His blood that when we leave here today we can leave knowing that God has forgiven us and that He loves us and He is bringing us into His fold. And we must continue to teach the way the Bible tells us to teach. If we don't, the Bible just becomes 
a book of philosophy. But to us, it is much, much more. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord, we are your people, chosen by your grace to be your own possession. And we have been granted mercy upon mercy. Hear your people now who cry to you in need. Remember us according to the favor that you have shown us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Make us to know your ways, O Lord, that we may walk in the path of salvation made known in your word. Hear our complaints and quiet them by your merciful deliverance, that we may respond with trust and thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy, encourage us, O Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that we not lose heart but being of one mind and one will, we may serve you with gladness, doing the works of the kingdom and speaking your words of witness through the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, O Lord, to hold fast to your word and bless us with, your faith, with faithful pastors who will preach and teach your eternal gospel, that we may rejoice in doing your will guide those considering church work and vocations, and bless them as they are framed and formed into your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shine your light upon us, O Lord, that we may do what is good, right, and live in faithful citizens in our nation. Bless our president, our governor, and all those who are elected and appointed to make, administer, and judge our laws. Lord, in your mercy. Enlighten us with God godly knowledge and wisdom, O Lord, and bless those who pursue science to improve our lives and the lives of those in greatest need. Bless all honorable vocations and honest labor, and lead the unemployed to good jobs and noble work not only for their own interests, but for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Show us your compassion, O Lord, and in your mercy grant healing, comfort, and peace to all who suffer. Deliver them from all their afflictions, pain, sorrow, illness, and fear. We especially pray for those in our hearts Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide us, O Lord, that with all of our hearts, minds, and bodies, and resources, we may serve you. Give special blessings to the Lutheran Women's Missionary League and the many ways that they bring good news of your salvation and the works of your love across the nation and the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Unite us, O Lord, that we may be of one mind and one will in doctrine, witness, and service. Bless us that we can come to your bidding to receive the body and the blood of your Son at his table. That we receive this Holy Communion, we may keep 
holy hearts and holy lives, Lord, in your mercy. Help us, O Lord, to remember the faithful who loved and served you and who now rest from their labors. Bring us with them to that most blessed day when they with us, we shall dwell with them in your presence and forevermore, Lord, in your mercy. Grant to us all good things needful for this body and life and profitable for all salvation and to keep us from all things harmful that, sustain, that we may be sustained in this time of want and guarded in the time of prosperity that we may endure to the day of our Lord's coming and be judged worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you.